Okay, well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome along to our, our talk this morning, which is part of the Food for Thought series, which has been organised by the Yorkshire Beach Rangers. And um, as you all know, Yorkshire Beach Rangers is a great project. It's a, a collaboration between Cornwall Wildlife Trust and Cornwall College with funding from Our Bright Future, which is, um, which is uh, from the community fund, the lottery funding. So yeah, so there's been a whole series of talks and this one today is, is, been, is focusing in on seafood. So my name is Matt. For those of you who haven't met me before, um, I work at Cornwall Wildlife Trust. I'm a, a marine biologist by trade. And I've spent a lot of time on fishing boats over the years. And um, I suppose this is kind of why, uh, why this is one of the subjects that, that um, is kind of very close to my heart. I feel that, you know, um, fishing has, you know, in the world of conservation has sort of at times, you know, got an unfairly bad, bad press. Uh, fishing is something that feeds, uh, I think it's three billion people in, in the, on the planet rely on seafood as their main source of protein. So it's obviously important to people. Um, but, you know, you can get it spectacularly wrong if, you, if you're not careful and you know, you've all heard stories of overfishing. I think because of this, I think people are a bit confused there about seafood. And living in Cornwall, you know, we, we're lucky, aren't we? We've got an abundance of fantastic seafood on offer that's been caught by our local fishermen. Um, but there are some people who have really got out of the habit of eating it. And, you know, that might be because they've heard about negative things about fishing. Um, or it might be that they just choose not to eat seafood for other reasons. But actually, I think part of the problem is that um, people we're a bit unclear and the information that we get quite often from the media and other sources is never all that balanced and uh, this is why we ended up developing the sea the good seafood guide project as a way of really sort of helping people make good choices that, um, so they're confident that when they eat seafood they're not harming the environment and they're supporting fishermen who are who are fishing sustainably and um, responsibly so um we are you know like i said we we are lucky there's nothing better than fresh mackerel. You've got to, you know, when you talk to people about why eating seafood, those who don't eat seafood don't really get it. And um, if you do eat seafood, you need to try really fresh mackerel, um, you know, straight out of straight out of our Cornish waters. It really is um, delicious, and it's also very good for you. It's full of omega-3 oils. Historically, Cornwall was pretty much built on fishing, as you know, and mining. Um, but before mining, fishing was feeding us. And it continues to be important to us to this day, both sort of economically, but also culturally, um, his, you know, historically for certain. But it's it's a big part of our culture, really, in Cornwall. And um, yeah, other reasons to eat fish. Well, increasingly, I mean, probably the the, the thing that is the the most scary thing at the moment, the thing that many of us are, are worried about, is the climate emergency. And the fact that individually we all have a role to play with our carbon footprint in that and many people are looking at what they're eating as is one way of trying to reduce their carbon footprint and um, I think you know that's, that's a good thing a really good thing and actually when you look at um, different sources of food protein quite often does have a very high carbon footprint um, but if you get fishing right and it's it's not overfished and it's well managed. Actually, harvesting wild food chains is actually quite a, an efficient way of getting protein, and a lot of people sort of have lost sight of that. Um, you know, natural ecosystems are highly productive, and out there at, at sea at certain times of year, there are massive shoals of fish for us to harvest. We just have to be careful we don't overdo it. Uh, and actually, when you look at um, carbon um, footprint of lots of different sources of protein, the fish doesn't score. Perfect. Uh, um, next slide. I'm failing to <laughs> look here. There we go. The next slide shows you um, a few different um, carbon footprint scores. This is taken uh, from a, an article in Nature, and um, it's quite oversimplified, but it just shows you uh, the largest carbon footprint is generally red meat, things like um, beef, beef and um, lamb, etc. Having said that, you know, locally grazed um, 
beef that's fed on um, you know, fed on grass um, is actually has a far lower carbon footprint than other sources of, of meat, meat that's fed on um, maize, for example. So this is a kind of simplification, but it just shows you that the seafood, which is the sort of blue area, is kind of middle of the road here in general. But when you look closely, you can see um, non trawl fishing comes out quite low. So this is fishing that, that's not um, mobile fishing, which we'll be talking about in a minute, is, it uses a lot of fuel and it creates quite a lot of carbon. So yeah, fishing that involves less energy use is quite low. Uh, and it's you know probably lower than poultry and pork. Ones that have higher carbon footprint are recirculating agriculture. This is where where you try and farm fish, bush for um, prawns, etc., on land, and you've got uh, tanks like aquariums with water being pumped around. That has a high carbon footprint relatively, and um, trawling as well. As I already mentioned, pushing a heavy net through water is using a lot of fuel. Non-recircling aquaculture, so that's aquaculture out in cages, in um, fish kept in pens, or um, even better, mussels uh, and oysters, which are kept um, in, you know, which just grow naturally in the natural environment. They have a much lower carbon uh, carbon footprint. Is everyone hearing me? All right. I just had a warning that I've got poor internet. Can you hear? Is my voice coming through? Okay, Cheryl, I can see your face. Yeah, you can hear me. Good. It's probably my children. Obviously, they're they're working from home and they're both on the internet. I'm sure, as they always are, these kids. I can hear you. Good. Mostly. Okay. Good. I just got a little warning that appeared on my screen. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. So yeah. So carbon. In terms of carbon, seafood, if we're careful with it, is is a fairly good way of getting protein. Um, you know, still there's lots of people who have decided that they, they're going to be vegetarian and not going to eat any seafood, and that's fine. We totally respect that, and um, you know that we, we we commend anyone who's looking at reducing their carbon impacts on the on the planet. But but you know, there's many people who, for whatever reasons, do want to continue eating seafood, and, and they you know the health benefits I already mentioned are important. They've got a great source of omega three. So if you're care careful and you choose your seafood carefully, you, you can still continue to have quite a low carbon diet. Now, um, having said, said all that, there are countless examples, you know, going back through history of humans really um, allowing fishing to get out of hand. And a productive ecosystem is only productive if you take out the right amount. Once you start taking out too much, you can end up having all kinds of problems as as has been documented and if any of you want a, a bit more detail this book which is absolutely um, um, brilliantly written but also very disturbing by Professor Callum Roberts just takes you through hu the human um, impact on, on the planet through, uh, through fishing um, you know going back a long way I mean we were overfishing a long time ago and it started out with you know exploitation of whales and um, you know we ended up you know exploiting virtually you know then exploiting fish and um, we've had a massive impact on the planet it's undeniable and it, it's well documented in this book and, and um, anyone who sort of studied marine ecology would have heard about it so things go wrong and it's human nature really um, summed up in um, a very famous uh, paper called the tragedy of the commons which basically explains that human nature naturally tends to want to result in overfishing because everyone uh, always feels if I don't catch it, they will. Uh, and eventually, um, sadly, without management, you do tend to find yourself in a situation where this very productive um, system ceases to become as productive. And um, just so, just giving a, an example, I mean, I've obviously. Um, I grew up in Falmouth and my, where we live, we look out over Falmouth Bay where I grew up. And as a kid, um, you know, we used to go out mackereling, we used to catch loads of mackerel. It was, it was great fun. You just put a hand line in the water with some hooks and, you know, catch them away. It seems to be a bit harder to catch them these days. Anyway, I remember in the, in the 1980s in Falmouth Bay, absolutely full of large fishing ships. Uh, in the sort of uh, late 70s, 
the handliners were doing very, very well. And there was a local cooperative, the, um, the fishermen were making a good living out of handlining, and they had been doing so for a very long time. But the words soon got around, large pelagic um, fur stainers appeared on the scene. These had come down from Scotland and from the North Sea, where the mackerel stocks had been massively overfished. And they started fishing away. Huge processing um, factory ships appeared. You know, a lot of them were um, Dutch or um, Russian, and they were um, they were processing large, large quantities of mackerel on a daily basis, just out, you know, in Falmouth Bay. Uh, in fact, at night time, it looked like a city out there. There's just lights everywhere, and this this sort of um, mackerel bonanza carried on for quite a few years, and eventually uh, the mackerel disappeared. So they um, didn't last that long. It's a great shame. This fishery could have um, if it had carried on um, as just a handline fishery. It could still be very lucrative to our local men today. But nowadays, handliners really struggle to make a living. Um, stocks of mackerel at that time were estimated to be um, about 30 million tonnes in the northeast Atlantic. And at the end of that period, they'd gone down to about 1 million tonnes. Now, they've started recovering in recent years. But they're still nowhere near that level. They're more like sort of four or five million tons. So that was a huge, you know, and it wasn't just what happened in, in, in Cornwall. It was going on across the whole North Atlantic at that during that sort of time. Mackerel was being heavily overfished. So overfishing has happened, you know, in my in my memory. And I've spoken to a lot of the fishermen involved at the time, and they all kind of agreed with me that it, it, it was a bit. Well, it was it was overfishing, and um, protections come in since then, but it came in after that happened. So here's the mackerel box. It is a large area where industrial fishing for mackerel, using those sort of methods, purse seining and pelagic trawling, are prohibited. And um, so in that large area, you're only allowed to fish using hand lines or gill nets. And the, the fishing effort on mackerel in, in the mackerel box is, is much, much lower, which is a great thing. This area is an important spawn, spawning ground for mackerel. And uh, certainly this is a really good conservation measure. Uh, shame it wasn't brought in a bit earlier. But um, for that reason now, if you want to eat mackerel and you buy it locally, you're going to be buying it from the hand liners. And, um, you know, you can know it's, it's, uh, it's good and it's sustainable. Um, but yeah, we've also seen similar situation with trawling. So this is landings um, of commercial fish to UK ports. And this shows you the effects of 118 years of industrial fishing on UK bottom trawling. This is taken from a, a brilliant um, article by um, Burston et al. And it just shows you um, the black dots are English registered fishing vessels and the open dots are the rest of the UK. And you can see that the fishing effort increased uh, for many years from the 1800s up until sort of the 1950s. Uh, sorry, the landings increased. There was a big dip, dip there, two dips, sorry, during the, the two world wars. But after the Second World War, you know, there was a bit of a bump a couple of years, but eventually landings started to decrease. And if you look at fishing effort, which is the amount of power being used. Um, you know, the, the amount of fish you catch for the power, you, uh, the power that you're putting into the fishing, the effort you're putting into the fishing, you find that, you know, in, at the start of this graph, they would catch a lot of fish um, for each sort of unit of power, fishing effort. Uh, what they were finding is that their catches were, were starting to dwindle, though, going through into the sort of 1920s, and then technology improvements meant that you know, they were able to in increase their catches. This is when they were really increasing sort of the power of trawlers and um, the efficiency of the gear. And that um, efficiency meant that they caught more and more fish and they did really well until about the 1960s. And presumably about around that point, they reached a, a point where they were catching too much and stopped the landings. Despite fishing harder, the landings decreased. So, you know, those, those are two examples of what happens if you catch too many fish. If you, um, I remember being shown this graph when I was at university that shows you um, a generalised view of a fishery. If you fish harder, at the start of that graph, you catch more. But you reach a point where if you fish harder, 
the population is suffering and your catches start to decrease. What you really need to try to do is to keep the um, keep the um, fishing effort at a sensible level and stay at this level called sustain, maximum sustainable yield. You definitely don't want to fish too hard and end up in this danger zone where you're at the risk of the fishery collapsing. You need to stay in the safe zone. And some of you will have heard of this term, maximum sustainable yield. Actually, maximum sustainable yield is kind of on a bit of a knife edge. You, you actually are sensible really to stay more in the safe zone. And you hear quite a few fishery scientists talking about the fact that the cost of fishing increases with fishing effort. The harder you fish, the more it costs. So actually, you're probably safer staying where this line is, this second line, which is um, what we would call the maximum economic yield. And in that place, you're making the same amount of profit as you would be at maximum sustainable yield, but you are further into the safe zone. The problem with, ma with managing fishing, though, is that it's not very simple. And in, especially in Cornwall, we have over 60 different species of fish that exist out there on, you know, swimming around just over our continental shelf. And when you go fishing, it's hard to sort of target one of those fish. You're obviously, you're often going to get a mixture. It's hard to know what's going on for every species. Um, a famous Norwegian science, fishery scientist said, it's not rocket science, it's way more complicated. The problem is it's hard for you to work out where you are on that graph. And obviously there'll be a graph like that for every different species you're encountering as well, which makes it even more complicated. You find that um, fishery scientists might say you're in one position, but a fisherman might disagree and say, no, you're in a different position and it's very difficult to tell. The other thing is fish don't stay in one place. So in, um, in Cornwall, we might, we might think the, the fish we're catching are our mackerel, but actually they're not. They roam all around the Northeast Atlantic and we have to work with our neighbours, um, our neighbouring countries if we're to manage that stock. If you expect or suspect a fishery of being overfished, then the, the answer is often to try and reduce the catch, but this is never popular with the fishermen, it costs the businesses. People who have invested a huge amount in that business, understandably, aren't going to be one of, aren't going to want to be told to throw back and catch left. But we've seen that in time it, it will re result, it, you know, usually results in um, in populations um, increasing again and therefore in time us being able to catch more again in quotas to increase, but it takes a lot of time. There are some examples like the cod of um, the Grand Banks of Newfoundland. Um, they were fished to such a level that the populations, despite the, the quota, you know, despite the fishery being cut right back, the populations haven't recovered. So in some cases, you, you cause irreversible damage. But there are many other examples of fisheries that have bounced back, including in our waters, um, Hake is one great example, and, and so is Sol, both of which were being overfished in the 1990s, and now, they're, now they've bounced back really well after increased uh, management. Uh, another thing you need to do is look at breeding areas. So if you can protect breeding areas, that really helps the future of that fishery. Um, you definitely don't want to be targeting fish as they spawn. And obviously a healthy environment is, is also essential. Uh, and a damaged environment leads to less growth. At the present, we've got a lot of global con conservation issues. I already mentioned um, climate change, but also carbon in our atmosphere is, is acidifying the ocean and long term it could have uh, major implications on many of our oceans, um, our oceans, food chains and processes. And you know, human, humans are guilty as well of polluting the the oceans with chemicals and uh, increasingly plastics. So there's lots of different, um, it's a complicated situation as, I, as I've already said, but in Cornwall we are surrounded by coastline and we've got a huge amount of um, small scale inshore fishing as well as larger sort of more commercial offshore fishing and it's actually um, a bit oversimplified to, to say it's it's all bad. There's many different types of fishing that are very sustainable and we should be supporting fishermen who are fishing responsibly. And 
and really this, this is the very similar to the argument that um that we have on land where we feel that it's vital that we work with people rather than working against people if you start just being negative all the time you end up caught in this constant battle with with um with people that you disagree with and you rarely get anywhere so in the same way as we work with farmers on land we decided that we should start working better with fishermen and we found that the public were very confused and they kept coming to see the wildlife trust for advice and it was very hard to answer those questions about what seafood should they be eating um, at, um, at the, prior to this project because, because we hadn't really done the research there is um like i said many different methods of fishing being used in cornwall so here's a little slide that just shows you some of the mobile fishing gear being used the disadvantage of mobile fishing gear, as, as I've said already, is that you're pulling a large net through, through the water and dragging it over the seabed as well sometimes. That's going to use a lot of fuel, so it has a high carbon footprint. However, positive things about this method of fishing, uh, that the, the gear design has certainly improved. and We know a lot more about how to make this, these methods of fishing selective than we used to. Um, in Cornwall, our fleet has been, our trawl, trawling fleet has been reduced quite significantly. We have now quite a small fleet, and there are also more restrictions on that fleet and more areas they can't go into, uh, limits on um, days at sea, etc., power on their boats and mesh sizes. There is an argument often coming from the fishing industry that the areas that are highly productive and good fishing for trawling have all been fished already and going over it again um, arguably does a little more damage you know there are certainly some areas though that are highly fragile and you know, we have to be careful about that argument there's also an argument that storms ha have more impact on seabed than fishing gear and certainly in shallow areas that may may well be the case um, but it's complicated and there are there are undeniably negative impacts of mobile gears but it does create the bulk of landings to the UK and our feeling is that if you have a well managed mobile fishery with stocks you know are healthy a mobile fishery doesn't necessarily always mean an unsustainable fishery but to the contrary it can be sustainable if it's done correctly static gear so static gear, here's a couple of examples. Um, crab pots, lobster pots, and gill nets. And the advantages of these are they have a lower carbon footprint, nothing's getting dragged through the water. Uh, crab pots are certainly very selective. If you catch a crab or a lobster that's too small, you just chuck it back. So um, it, you know, it, it will live to fight another day and you can catch it when it's bigger. Disadvantages though, the nets in particular can have disadvantages in that they uh, we've heard about bycatch of cetaceans, seals and seabirds. Sometimes this can be hard to avoid. And if you lose pots or if you lose nets, you end up with problems uh, like ghost fishing where the gear continues to fish after you've lost it. And uh, obviously that's, that's not good either. So there are pros and cons with these types of fishing. Um, pelagic fishing, this means open water fishing. Um, there's obviously the, the most environmentally friendly method of pelagic fishing is hook and line fishing. And in Cornwall, we've got a hand lining where you can see in the, the picture on the bottom right where you basically have a, a, a rope with a weight on the end and lots of small lines come off with hooks and you jig that up and down to catch the fish in that way. That is a very selective method of fishing. You'll only catch fish who you can get the hooks in their mouth so you generally are catching less undersized fish and you, you're not hitting the seabed. Other methods of pelagic fishing, again the advantage is you're rarely touching the seabed. Um, sardine uh, ring netting, sometimes the bottom of the net will actually drag over the seabed slightly but it's not kind of on the same same level of impact as pulling trawl. Um, disadvantages of large um, ring net fisheries and large midwater trawls as you can see in the other diagram there um, potentially could be interaction with cetaceans so we know in pelagic trawling there there's been issues in the past pair trawling and um, resulting in dolphin bycatch so you have to be careful of that the other the other problem with these um, methods of fishing is you could actually accidentally catch too many fish and in ring netting 
that is a, a danger. Highly skilled skippers are constantly trying to make sure they don't do that, but sooner or later, eventually, you know, it, it can happen that you've caught too many fish, more fish than you can get into your boat, and then you release those fish, and, and uh, you know, you can end up quite often with those fish dying, and um, that's uh, you know, a real waste. Uh, something that no one likes to see. So there are some disadvantages with that sort of method. Uh, and then um, a couple more methods. So obviously um, some of you will have come across farmed mussels out in St Oscar Bay. There's a massive area now of mussel farming and farming shellfish like mussels and oysters is actually a very um, a, a very low carbon method of getting protein. You basically put the um, put tiny babies to spat into the water and they'll grow attached to ropes or in cages in the case of oysters and they feed themselves on plankton and you're not having to chuck fish food into the water they are basically just extracting natural food from around them they're also locking up carbon when they create their shells so a very uh, low carbon footprint method uh, way of getting um, protein and then one other method that um, some of you would have heard of is the dredging of oysters in the fowl and obviously this is a mobile fishing method, but it's a fishing method which is arguably uh, far less environmentally damaging in that it's being carried out in an area where dredging has been done for centuries in this way. Um, and the power is restricted so that they're not allowed to use motors. So they're only pulled by sail power and the dredges themselves are pulled by hand. So um, due to the limitation of the size of a human, <laughs> I suppose, you can't operate, uh, you can't pull a really heavy dredge. It's just exhausting work. So, uh, and there are restrictions set in the local bylaws on the sizes of the dredges. So it's a bit of a, a crummy drawing. This is a sketch I did the other day. There's meant to be little lines between these dredges. So a, a small boat, um, 20, 28 foot or so with two, two crew will be pulling four dredges and constantly lifting one dredge, emptying it, and chucking it back, sorting through the catch and then pulling the next one. And the dredge itself doesn't have teeth, it just has a bar, a metal bar along the front of the net that um, drags along the bottom and it, it's designed to pick up um, the culch, which are empty shells mixed in with live oysters. And um, yeah, the, the fishermen will argue that they've been doing this for so long that they actually have kind of a harrowing effect on the, on the bottom of the seabed. And, they feel that it improves the productivity of that fishery, which is an interesting uh, theory and certainly uh, one that has, has been talked about for a very long time. It'd be really interesting if it could be investigated and proven. Uh, that's kind of, um, there's a picture of me when I was a lot younger and had a lot more hair. I actually worked on the oyster fishery when I was a lad. And, it, you know, having just come out of university and been given a lot of doom and gloom about fishing, it was really refreshing to be working on a fishery that seemed really well managed. You know, forward thinking uh, fisheries officers or, you know, powers that be uh, banned the use of engines well before um, they've got established in the foul. And it's kept that fishery going uh, really, really well. Fishermen can still make a living. Stocks are still relatively good. And, um, you know, it's kept a traditional way of life going and it's a really important part of, of our culture in the foul. And that sort of inspired me, I remember as a, as a lad, to think that actually, you know, there can be things, there surely are things we can do to help fishermen continue to be sustainable and to, to keep them, you know, keep them in business whilst also protecting the environment. So when I started work at the Wildlife Trust, we, um, we wanted to be working better with fishermen and, and we decided to try and create a project that helps people make good choices when they choose seafood. What we didn't want to create is a project that just bashes fishermen and says, look, we don't like what you're doing there. We thought it would be much better to take a positive approach and just work with all the things we have in common with fishermen and get people behind their local fishermen, particularly the guys who are really aware of sustainability and really improving the way they work. So we bring together information on all of the local fisheries we call them in a format the public can understand and use. And the idea is to promote Cornish sustainable seafood and highlight best practice. And in the long term, our, our hope is that this will help the whole fishery, it will help incentivise uh, further improvements to the whole fishery. And our mantra is that healthy seas are important not just for wildlife, but they're vital for fishermen. And we, 
we want to focus in on that fact that we have that in common with the fishing industry. We all need healthy seas and, uh, and productive fisheries are only possible in healthy seas. So some of you will have already visited it, hopefully. Um, you've seen the website and um, we created the Cornwall Good Seafood website back in 2015. It's been really popular. It helps people make good choices and it features information on over 60 species, 13 different fishing methods. And we provide information, we, we feel, in a, a balanced way so that a casual visitor can quickly get advice on what's sustainable and what to go for. But if, if you want to learn a lot more about fishing, you can delve deeper and get loads more detail. And what do we mean by sustainable? Which is quite an important point to make. You know, um, you talk to people, and lots of people have different opinions on what sustainable means. Some people think that sustainable means, well, I've managed to be a fisherman for my whole life, and I'm still catching fish, so therefore it's sustainable. That is a that's a very valid interpretation of that. But the way we look at sustainability, we have to be like a little bit more specific. You know, we, we are concerned that if you set up a fishery that is profitable, eventually, if it's, you know, human nature means lots of people will join that fishery. So what's there to stop that fishery getting overfished? How well managed is it? That's one thing that we think is very important to think about when thinking about is a fishery sustainable? Is there something in place that will stop this ever getting out of hand? Another thing that's really important is to look at the actual biology of the fish that we're talking about and um, also then to look at the impacts on the environment. So there's lots of things that come into the sustainability. Now at the early stages of our project, we were working with a, a steering group and we went around, you know, discussed this at, at length as to how we could judge sustainability and whether or not we should create our own system of, of judging sustainability it was debated. But after much discussion, we felt actually, because we are down here in the southwest of England, isolated on the end of a peninsula, if we created our own method, it, it, it may not really um, be as valuable to the industry um, as working with other existing methods. So we just we contacted the Marine Conservation Society, who have been running their Good Fish Guide for many years and is very well respected, and we asked um, about using their scoring method. And we've ended up with a great working relationship with, with these guys. At that point, if you looked at Cornish fish on their website, they were quite poorly represented. There's many, um, many species that just weren't on there. They didn't, they didn't have people on the ground in Cornwall to, to flag up that these fisheries existed to therefore feature on their website. So what we've, what we've done is we've, we've actually worked with them. We're using exactly the same method of scoring seafood. Um, we look at stock status. We look at the management and we look at the capture method. So all the three things that I mentioned already. And we apply exactly the same rules to all Cornwall fisheries as they do to the rest of the UK. And what we've ended up with is far better representing Cornish fish on the system. And you can easily um, compare our scores that we've created here in Cornwall on Cornish fish with seafood that's come from the other side of the world you know, or even the rest of the UK. So when you when you're browsing our website, this is the this is the home page. We have sort of a random selection pop up of, of sustainable choices. But if you want to see the full list of sustainable choices, you just click the uh, the button there. View all recommended species. If you come across um, or if you if you're looking for something that you've seen on a menu and it doesn't appear on our website, it may not be Cornish. And obviously, when you're offered seafood, well, you know there's a lot of great local seafood available, but there's still seafood being imported. So um, we recommend that you visit the, the Marine Conservation Society's website and you can probably find, the, find it on there. When, likewise, when you're on their site, if you look at a Cornish species like Cornish lobster, for example, you get directed to our website. So we've got a great sort of link with, with the guys from the Marine Conservation Society. Uh, and um, we early on decided when it comes to seafood scoring, um, the, system, the Marine Conservation Society system is a five point system. So um, the most sustainable seafood gets um, a rating of one and the least sustainable seafood gets a rating of five. So the smaller the number, the better. Now, I don't know about you, but there's loads of these sort of scoring systems and I'm not that great with numbers. And my feeling is that actually fixing on and, you know, trying to remember, oh, is five best or is one best actually could, could count against us. So we decided to, to 
create this symbol, the recommended symbol, which we will allow all trees to use. Um, and if they get it, get a score of three or better. So well, one, two or three, now five, you can use the recommended symbol. And that's our sort of main communication method. So this recommended list is available for you to look at and to download on the website. And look out for that symbol that's appearing now on packaging and on, on menus when restaurants are open and uh, on websites. And that's kind of your, um, we're hoping that, you know, that's going to gain recognition. It certainly is being used a lot. But eventually, you know, you'd like to see this all across the, the county and people seeing that and knowing that they're choosing sustainable tea. So there you go. So that's the that's the project. When you click on a fish, you can get a load more detail. You can see about the seasonality. You can learn about sustainability. You can also read about um, the status of the stock, the management of that fishery. There are lots of references on there. So um, depending on what level you're at, if you if you just want to a bit of help to make a quick decision that's there for you but if you also want to really do your homework and learn about fishing there's a huge amount of information on the website there and um, this just shows you the um for hake we've got um two different methods that hake is caught we've got trawl caught hake and gillnet caught hake and the um, gillnet caught hake is is um certified sustainable by msc and um yeah, as I was saying to you earlier, actually, hake is a great example of a fishery which was very, um, a stock which was very overfished back in the 90s. Hake was very rare around our waters. And the hake recovery plan, which is a Europe wide management scheme, came in and that really reduced the catches of hake. And hake stocks have really bounced back. Additionally to that, um, our, our local hake fishermen, and in fact, all of the, the, the hake netting boats across Europe are now um, required to use dolphin scaring pingers on their nets, which frighten away cetaceans from their nets. So they, you know, those factors and the fact that it's also certified by Marine Stewardship Council will add up to give uh, gill net caught, caught hake a, a great score. Trawl net, trawl caught hake is also still a great score. It's still a two, which is good. It's within our recommended um, bands, but it's, you know, perhaps perhaps less so than the, the gilded one. Okay, so bring it up to date now, obviously a few weeks ago, all of this, you know, this was going on quite nicely. We're helping people make good choices. The restaurants were doing really well. And then suddenly coronavirus came along and literally overnight, all of the restaurants and pubs were shut down. The export markets for crab and other shellfish dried up almost instantly. And the fishermen that we've been working with for years were uh, basically facing the prospect of well, um, you know, is it worth our while going to see? You know, many of these guys are you know, self-employed. They've got young families. They're fishing really sustainably. We really wanted to do what we could to help them. And um, the good news is that the fishermen really rose to this challenge. And we we've, we've been trying to do what we can to highlight the amazing effort that that um, fishermen all around the county have taken to try to try to reconnect with the local population so you know we've got guys who who have been good at this already in the past and good at marketing themselves but the majority of fishermen still use markets to land their fish and when those markets couldn't take their fish they were basically faced with that you know either sell it locally or just give up so anyway um with the help of abby my brilliant volunteer and um, we've created a list on our website of fishermen who will sell direct to the public and a list of businesses that were still working. So many of our fishmongers were still buying from the fishermen and then distributing fish, which is great. And many of our larger companies who would have previously supplied um, the wholesale market were actually switching to um, doing online delivery. So people who are on lockdown were able to get good local seafood delivered. And we did. We tried to do what we could to promote that. And you know, soon had a big list on our website, which is our Instagram, um, which. Um, Abby's been brilliant uh, and we've created, you know, Abby has created lovely lists here of all different suppliers of seafood in all of those areas of Cornwall. Uh, you guys can go on the website and browse these. Um, you, you're never far from a fisherman who will, who will either sell you the fish at the harbour when he comes ashore or possibly even deliver it to you. And you're also never far from, well, no matter where you are in the UK, there are many companies that will do nationwide delivery, often free of charge and um, you know high quality local sustainable fish our website is still there to help you choose to make sure you're choosing sustainable but all of these companies 
um, uh, have been doing a great job um, of supplying uh, and keeping um, and trying to get our local U well our local and our UK market stronger. So over the years, fishermen have really relied on this export market, and it's quite a you know the actual the local market we think is probably one we're going to have to focus on a lot more, particularly as we've got a threat of Brexit looming and uh, potential impact that might have on our exports. But also, you know, we, we feel it's important that locals understand fishing and support sustainable fishing. And it isn't just a luxury commodity that just goes straight out of the count, out of the county, and out of the country. So it's really positive. We've also had lots of other initiatives, many of them from the industry itself. So um, Seafood Cornwall um, set up the Fish to Your Door hashtag Fish to Your Door, which is a great scheme. They've got lots of people getting fish deliveries. Fish on Friday, which is run by the Fishmongers Company, is a national project. And they, they've created a big map as well, which helps you find seafood. And uh, the Blue Marine Foundation as well have created the hashtag local fish for dinner campaign. And uh, you know, they've been doing very similar work to us, but in other parts of the country. So it's been it's been really interesting, and you know, I think um a really positive time in that people have started to sort of chat with their fishermen. Many people started to include good sustainable local seafood in their diet. And we're all kind of guilty of it these days, aren't we? Um, a lot of people do all their food shopping in supermarkets and, and we've lost that connection with the fishing industry. So we kind of feel that although the coronavirus has been a, a, a blow, a horrible blow to the industry, we kind of see the silver lining really in the, the fact that fishermen all around Cornwall are starting to actually look at, yeah, actually supplying local people, building our links with local people and local appreciation for sustainable fishing can only be a good thing. So there you go. So um, massive thank you to Abby, who's worked really hard. She's volunteered for us all through lockdown and you know, basically run the social media, kept this massive list of fishermen and fish sellers up to date and liaised with brilliantly with people. Um, we also you know, thank everyone who's been involved with, um, with the project, all of our brilliant supporters. We've got lots of businesses, who, all of which are members of our supporters scheme, and that helps keep the project afloat. We've also had a little bit of funding from the Fishmongers Company this year, which is fantastic. And um, we continue to get European funding through the European Marine Fisheries Fund, which we're really grateful for. So just to finish up on, there's six species that I'd like you all to sort of um, look out for when you're at the Fishmongers counter. And probably um, all of these are very sustainable. Probably the most sustainable though are Cornish mussels, which I already mentioned, the rope grown. Hot caught crab, so potting for crab is a very a sustainable method of catching shellfish. Hake that I already mentioned, caught using dolphin friendly nets from a stock that's much recovered thanks to the hake recovery plan. Cornish sardines, which are doing really well these days, possibly due to sort of rising sea temperatures, which is a whole other topic and another talk. But yeah, sardines caught using ring nets, we've got a relatively small fleet of ring netters down here in Cornwall and um, you know they're trying to manage themselves and keep that fishery small and certainly um, a very low cost very good for you oily fish and um, one that you should be looking out for. Spider crab very underappreciated nearly all of the spider crab caught in Cornwall gets exported but stocks of spider crab are relatively healthy and again they're caught using um, pots and nets and mackerel which is caught using hand lines in Cornwall. We don't have any industrial fishing for mackerel these days which we're very grateful for. Sadly mackerel are still quite patchy in their distribution and at the moment there's not that many mackerel around particularly on the south coast. They'll hopefully turn up soon. Um, you know, the stock is still recovering from overfishing how, um, across, across its range but in Cornwall as I said we've got great measures. The mackerel box for that rip has really helped and you know, the handline fleet catch a very small quantity, only about 900 tonnes a year. So tiny compared to the, the uh, big industrial fishing that's going on for mackerel and other areas of Europe. So they need to be supported. And there you go. And, and visit our website for a, a brilliant list of all the other businesses that support us. Many of these are restaurants and sadly they've had a terrible time through coronavirus. I mean, to shut down, the majority of them shut down completely. Some of them still doing a small, small level of business. but 
you know, in the coming few weeks, they're going to need all the help we can give them. So if you fancy going out for um, you know, a nice seafood meal, please visit our website and go and visit one of our supporters. And there you go. Thank you very much. So we, um, I'm just going to, I've got, that's kind of the end of the presentation. I hope you all found that interesting. I've got a bit of time here now. Um, if any of you have got some questions you'd like to ask, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm going to do is um, I'm just going to, oh, we've got, we've got a, a thumbs up. That's nice. We've got a clap. So um, I didn't get to talk to all of you. Some of you arrived during the meeting, so um, welcome along if you came in halfway through. I think Jack joined us halfway through. You might have a few, a few questions, you know, perhaps things that I might have missed out near the start of, of the presentation. So what I'm just going to do, I'm just going to pause the recording.